Hey everyone, it's the Doom Dog. Dalton and I recently finished a co-op playthrough of the second Gears of War for the channel. As always is the case, that means that it is time to piece together a video review of it. Today we will be taking a look at Gears of War 2, released in 2008 exclusively for the Xbox 360. The first Gears of War was a smash hit selling more than 6 million copies and a technical showpiece for what the Xbox 360 was capable of. The second one had huge shoes to fill as a result. But Cliff Plazinski promised fans of the first game that the sequel would be bigger, better, and more badass than the original. Given how beloved the first game turned out to be, that is a bold claim to make. Did it live up to that? Let's find out. Gears of War 2 starts six months after the end of the first game and the detonation of the light mass bomb. It did not go quite according to plan. It did not end the war with the Locust Horde. It did kill off a lot of them though. It also vaporized a lot of emulsion in the underground and infected many soldiers with a fatal disease called Rust Lung. Things have seemed rather quiet for a while, but recently locust hordes have found ways to sink entire cities. Humanity's strongholds have been sinking into the ground, and there are only a few left at the start of the game. The city of Jacinto seemed to be impenetrable, and it remains one of the last and most well-defended strongholds. The Cog want to launch a massive counterattack to try to prevent Locust Hordes from taking the city or sinking it. The game begins with Delta Squad getting a new recruit. Marcus Phoenix and Dom Santiago are given a new soldier named Carmine. That name should sound familiar to anyone that played the first game as he is one of the brothers of the Carmine from it. Benjamin Carmine joined the Gears just like his brother. The beginning of the game sees Marcus and Dom training him in the basics of combat and they eventually get interrupted by the city being attacked by locusts. The story of the first Gears felt like it existed largely to set up the action. It was light on things such as explanations. It told you very little about the Cog government, the war, or who the locusts are. It gave you very little context for why you were doing anything that you were doing, and it felt like a missed opportunity as a result. That is not the case with Gears 2. This game gives you more information on the COG than what they do behind the scenes. It gives you a bit more context on the Locust and what they are doing. It does not answer every question you might have about the universe, but it gives you a lot more context for everything than the first game ever did. It helps you understand what you are doing and why, and gives you more of a reason to care. One thing that this game does exceptionally well is keep tone and focus. It is a very bleak story. Things seem to go wrong around every corner, and it has some surprises in it for the player. That much is for sure. The entire thing has a very bleak feeling to it all. There's a constant sense of dread and a bit of hopelessness. It does a great job of making the player feel a constant fear that things will not turn out well, even as you are accomplishing very badass things. Do not get me wrong. Just like the first game, this game places a fairly big emphasis on set-piece moments. The game has you doing some very cool things and experiencing some very badass events over the course of its runtime. But they do not have the same sense of fun that they did in the first one. The atmosphere is that heavy and depressing. It shines a very different light on them than the first game did, and that is to its benefit. It helps make the story more memorable. More than this, the game focuses exclusively on two characters, Marcus and Dom. The other characters from the first game, Baird and Cole, do show up at various points throughout the story, and you will fight with them. However, this is Marcus and Dom's game at heart. 
It is all about their friendship and Dom's search for his wife. It results in some excellent character building moments and some truly emotional scenes that you would never expect after having played the first game. All in all, the storytelling is a vast improvement over the first game. It still has its cheesy, dumb, fun lines, especially where Cole is involved, but it has a sense of weight and gravity to it that the first game largely lacked. It goes a long way to develop the two main characters and making you care more about them than you ever thought you would. That is not to say that it is perfect though, as it does have side characters that get far less focus than they should have for their stories to work. Ty and Dizzy spring instantly to mind in this regard. They are just not given enough screen time to fully develop, and it is a shame because they are decent characters for what little time they are on screen. Overall though, the story is a vast improvement over the first game. What about the graphics then? The first game was gorgeous in its time, and it was a prime example of how good the 7th gen consoles could look. It was so good looking that all Gears of War really needed to do was build on what the first game did, and that's pretty much what it does. This was used to show off improvements to the engine in first game, so what does it improve upon? The scope of this game is much larger than the first game. The first game took place in smaller and more enclosed space, and it was mostly things like hallways in buildings and fighting through streets around crumbling buildings. Once you get past the initial areas of this game, you will discover that it has a lot of much larger and more open areas. It was a bold move given that the first game did not always run amazingly well. Beyond that, there is a lot more variety to the environments in this game. This game will take you from the city settings to the underground. It will take you from laboratories to scaling mountains. It has you out on a boat in an underground river and going through underground palaces. There's quite a few areas that you will travel through and fight in. It's a big improvement over the first game in this regard. The game features sharper textures thanks to things like ambient occlusion that sharpens the overall image. It has improved weather effects that are put to great use at multiple points throughout this game. The game has a crowd system that lets the game display a ton of enemies at once. There are multiple points in the game with large crowds of enemies on screen at a time. It has water that you can interact with as well. Your bullets will cause splash effects, and it looks good. Not everything holds up extremely well, though. Lighting, for example, is not all that great at times. It does look better in underground areas, though. A lot of the indoor scenes do not look as good as they could with better lighting. The graphics for it do not hold up quite as well as they could as a result of that. This could definitely use an upgraded version like the first game got with Gears of War Ultimate Edition. The game also suffers the same problem with the color palette that the first game and many other games from this generation did. A lot of the environments seem to be made out of black, gray, and a billion different shades of brown. It makes more sense when you are in underground areas with a lot of dirt and rock. You see a lot of that in this game, but more color is always appreciated. I have said it before and I will do so again. I do not miss this about games from the seventh generation. How does it run on the Xbox 360 then? The first game did not run amazingly well. They were pushing new hardware hard with the game, and it definitely showed in how the game performed. This was two years later, and the team had more experience programming for the system. This actually runs significantly better than the first game did. I am not going to say that it never slows down, but it does it a lot less than the first game did. Slowdown is also less severe, than it was in the first game. Overall, this is an impressive package, especially for a game 
as old as it is. And for a console exclusive, it definitely does not look modern at all, but it does hold up pretty well. It is helped by killer art design, but this looks pretty good on a technical level. It runs pretty well. How does it sound then? Well, the game definitely matches the first game in terms of voice acting, which is to say that it's all great. Every character is voiced excellently in this game, and this script needs it. It has much heavier moments than the first game did. The voice actors need to show a greater acting range in it. As a result, every character is pulled off expertly. All of them sound great. The standouts, as you would expect, are Marcus and Dom. Because this game has more serious and darker moments that require a wider range of emotion. It required more from their performances. John DiMaggio voices Marcus and he is a seasoned voice actor who is fairly well known. You expect it out of him. Dom is voiced by Carlos Ferro. He is a lesser known name, but he is a seasoned actor as well. Both of them are top notch in their role. Outside of that, the rest of Delta from the first game are here as well. Baird and Cole are still fun, likable, and well-voiced characters. Michael Gaw is another standout as Carmine. The character goes from an unsure of himself to a more confident soldier over the course of the game, and Michael sells it. Sound effects are once again strong. This is a loud game, given that this game is filled with gunfire and explosions going off. For the vast majority of it, it makes sense. They all sound appropriately loud and powerful. Every weapon sounds powerful as hell, and every explosion thunders through your speakers with a bassy boom. The game has a focus on the horrors of war, so selling that is important. More than that, having weapons that sound powerful is very important to selling weapon feel in a shooter like this. If your weapons sound weak, they will not feel as good to fire. Sound design plays a huge role in how gun mechanics feel, and this game nails it. The weapons do sound amazing in this game, and I do love it for it. The first game had a pretty good score, with a few things that were excellent, and this game takes those and runs with them. There are quite a few tracks throughout that you won't forget long after you turn the game off. They are excellent tracks that are a big step up from the first game. This gets you amped and ready to get in the thick of it and take down Locust Horrors. What more could you ask for from a game like this? Well, I will tell you what. How about music that creates a thick, depressing, and foreboding tone and atmosphere? As I said earlier, this game has a sense of dread throughout, and the game's soundtrack has a lot to do with why that is. It is atmospheric as hell, and it is wonderful. It is not always the kind of music that sticks with you and gets stuck in your head, but it does not need to be. It creates a mood for the whole game that serves the setting and story very well. It drives a strong sense of emotion, and... It is excellent in that regard. The soundtrack is amazing. All in all, this is the complete package in terms of audio. The voice acting is excellent. The weapon audio is stellar. The environmental sound effects are convincing. The music ranges from blood pumping and memorable to atmospheric and moody. It has zero weak points in terms of audio. It was top notch in its day and it still holds up pretty damn well to this day. How does it play then? This is extremely similar to the first game. It is a cover-based third-person shooter, which means you will be hiding behind walls and popping out from them to take shots at enemies and kill them. You can hold four weapons at a time, two larger, two-handed weapons, a pistol, and some kind of grenade. You switch back and forth between them with the D-pad, and you pick up weapons and ammo left behind by enemies. Beyond that, the rodeo run returns as well. You can hold down the A button to make your character get down low to the ground and charge forward, and you have the ability to steer him 
one way or the other as you run. The dodge roll returns as well, which lets you roll from side to side and forward and backwards to dodge enemies. You can still melee them by hitting them with your weapon or by chainsawing them with the lancer. All the mechanics from the first game make a return here. So what's new? Well, this has temporary weapons. You can pick up the enemy's mortar weapons and use them to kill large groups of enemies all at once. This is a little bit difficult and tricky to get the hang of, but it can be fun when you do. You can also get a gun called the Mulcher. This is a mounted minigun style weapon that chews through ammo and kills pretty much any enemy very quickly. You carry it with you and hide behind walls and pull it out to open fire over the wall. It is a lot of fun, but it does have the catch where when you run out of ammo, you have to drop it and return to your normal weapons. You cannot reload these. They also slow your movement speed. Picking them up and carrying them with you makes you move very slow on the battlefield. You cannot roll while using them, so you are basically target practice for the enemies. It is a nice risk versus reward system where the extra power offered by these weapons might well be worth the risk of trying to find cover in time to effectively use them. The game also brings with it much better vehicle segments than the first game had. The first game had the one with the krill and it was not that long. The ones in this game are longer and more substantial than the first game and they break up the standard third person shooting gameplay nicely. The vehicles in this game are much better implemented than they were in the first game as well, and a lot more fun to use. You are in for a surprise with a couple of them as well. As previously stated, there is a lot more variety in the levels in this game as well. This goes a long way to keeping it from feeling repetitive. On top of being broken up with cool vehicle sections and one part on a boat that you do not actually have control over, this game has a much larger variety of environments to kill locusts in. It fleshes out the world quite a bit and let you see that it isn't all just crumbling buildings in stone. Though this game has its fair share of that too. This game has implemented destructible environments as well. There are a lot of stone structures in this game that will crumble when you fire at them. Pieces of them will chip off. It is cool to see, but it's no red faction. That is for sure. It feels a little half-baked because the gameplay never really does anything with it. It is just sort of there, and that's it. It's cool when you see it happen, but it makes you wonder what the point was. The game implements movable cover as well. There are shields that you can hide behind and carry with you as you make your way forward, and there are worms with incredibly tough hides that are impervious to weapon fire. You can encourage them to move by shooting fruits in the ceiling and causing it to fall. The worm will crawl towards the fruit, allowing you to get closer to the enemy as you use them for cover. Finally, this is a more substantial game than the first one was. This game will take you longer to beat than the first game. Even with the PC version adding the factory level where you fight the Brumac, this is a longer game than it. To me, it does not feel too long as it is an exciting ride from beginning to end. Having said that, there is one particular spot that does feel like a natural point to end the game, but it doesn't. It goes on for a couple more hours after that point. Some might argue that it outstays its welcome as such, but I do not mind. How about the replay value then? Well, this game has tons of it. There are multiple difficulty settings to try your hand at, of course, and there are collectibles to find. You can unlock a variety of different things by collecting them, and they provide you with more information on the world and little stories of its inhabitants that really help flesh it all out. 
It has cult plays both a local game and as an online experience as well, and it is a blast to play with friends. I have beaten it three separate times, and I know it won't be the last. Gears of War 2 does not reinvent the wheel, but it does not need to. The first game played great, and this builds on it. It features a lengthier campaign with more variety to it. It has more boss fights that are a lot of fun, and it has more cool set pieces with significantly better storytelling. With the co-op mode and collectibles, there is plenty of reason to play through it one more time. Despite how similar the two games play, it feels like a much better game overall than the first one. This is where I would usually tell you about other versions of the game that you can check out on top of the Xbox 360 original. But there aren't any. This game has never been ported to PC or anywhere else. To this day, it remains an Xbox 360 exclusive. You can play it on the Xbox One via backwards compatibility, though, and it has an enhanced version for the Xbox One X. You can play the game at native 4K on that console, and it looks better than ever when you do. The frame rate never drops. The problems with the lighting and the lower resolution textures are more evident at this resolution, however. If you have the Xbox Series consoles, that is probably the best way to play it, though it does play just fine on the original 360. Hey, Microsoft, give this game a PC port or an ultimate version just like the first shot. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. This game was fun to go back and play through, and I am a little bit surprised at how much of it I remember. Playing it co-op for the channel was an absolute blast. Leave your thoughts below. What do you think of Gears of War 2? If you could share this video, that would help me out a lot. Give this a thumbs up, and make sure you subscribe for future updates. Talk to you later, everybody. Doom Dog out.